Hi there, my name is Stephanie Heatbrink and um, I am um, on the prayer ministry staff here at Third Church. Uh, one of the main things that I am is the Lighthouse Ministry Director, but I also have uh, get to play a part in our healing ministry, which is why I am speaking with you today. Uh, today we're looking at the Holy Spirit. This is the Level 1 Prayer Training class, and I'm so excited to be teaching today. Um, now, wow, there is so much, right, that can be shared about the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be talking about who the Holy Spirit is and why he is so important as we pray for other people. But, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, as I was praying for this day, the thing that probably rose most in my spirit and uh, the hope that I think the Lord has for us today is that you would just leave with longing for a more intimate relationship with him. There's always more with God. There's always more for every single one of us. The Holy Spirit has more. None of us have arrived. You know, we're all on a journey, and we're all um, getting more well acquainted with the Holy Spirit each day, and that's gonna be a lifetime endeavor for us as believers. And as you look at church history, you know, there has been so much pain and divisiveness around the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to say to you today that here at Third Church, we take a very wide view um, on the expressions of the Holy Spirit. We don't try and put a lot of boxes on how he will come and what that should look like. In fact, um, I think the longer that I'm in prayer ministry, the more okay I have become with simply just embracing that there can be a lot of mystery with God. And so there are some things about the Holy Spirit that I'm quite sure of. Um, and that there, there are some other things about who he is and how he works that are still a little bit of a mystery to me. But uh, in spite of that mystery, there are many wonderful things that we can learn about him. And so I hope you see as we talk this morning that he is absolutely key for us to be able to encounter the fullness of life that God longs for us to have as his kids. So let me pray for us and then we'll jump into our morning. So, Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that uh, you sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. That as Jesus joined you in the heavens, that you gave us the good gift of the Holy Spirit to be our advocate, our guide, our comforter, uh, the one who empowers us for ministry. And so, Father, I pray for everybody who will be listening to this teaching today. Would you open their hearts? Would you enlighten us? Would you bring uh, your revelation to us as we seek to gain, gain a great under, understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how he longs to work in and through our lives? So thank you. Would you teach us about friendship with your spirit today? We love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Well, my guess is that um, many of us have grown up in mainline evangelical denominations that didn't really talk much about the Holy Spirit. And if they did, it was probably mostly about the fruits of the Spirit. And so um, I grew up in a really vibrant Presbyterian church. It was great. I, I had a wonderful foundation built um, of faith for me. But I didn't really know much about the work of the Holy Spirit. And... Um, how I was supposed to interact with the Holy Spirit in my life. And so my first experience of more of the charismatic gifts of the Spirit actually came from a neighbor of mine. And um, she, uh, I, I saw things at their house where they would lay, actually lay hands and, and pray for sick people. Um, she spoke in tongues when she prayed. She talked to us about spiritual warfare. But, um, and I can tell she had this really vibrant relationship with the Lord, and she was very passionate. And so it, it didn't necessarily seem good or bad. It more just seemed like I didn't know quite what to do with the things that I was seeing. I just didn't have a box to put uh, some of these experiences inside of. And so, you know, I think that for many of us that grew up in more mainline evangelical denominations, we grew up with a Holy Trinity that looked more like the Father the Son and the Bible, rather than the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you know, that's left us with a lot of questions about who the Holy Spirit is 
and how he wants to work in our lives and in and through us for kingdom expansion in the world. So again, my hope today is that we would just gain a, a greater understanding of how the Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives and in ministry to others. And uh, also just that an, an intimate desire to be in friendship and fellowship with him would be birthed in us today. Um, so I'm going to unpack for you this morning kind of three core beliefs that I would say we embrace about the Holy Spirit here uh, at Third Church. And um, we'll go from there. All right. So to start off with, one of the main things that uh, we have embraced about the Holy Spirit or that were really helpful for me on my journey is the belief that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. It is not some mystical force. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people is, this is not Star Wars, okay? So we're not trying to control a force. We're not like Yoda learning to master some power. The Holy Spirit is God, okay? He is a part of the Trinity. He is not just some mystical force. Um, he is a divine person. And this may seem like a really strange place to start, but it's actually very important. And it's important because first and foremost, our God is a relational God. And we were created to be in intimate relationship with him. Um, I'm in Mike Redmond's worship class right now. And one of the things that we've been talking about our first week was just why did God create us? And, you know, I think one of the core reasons for that was so that we could be in relationship with him. I love uh, John Piper's take on the Westminster Catechism, which just says, Man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. So we were first and foremost um, created for relationship. And uh, the Holy Spirit is really one of the key ways that we are invited to interact in a personal, relational way with our triune God. Now, when I say that the Holy Spirit is a person, I am not saying that he is human. He is very much divine, okay? So we need to remember that our humanity is a reflection of God's nature. And so some of the things that make us uniquely a person, we can even see in the personality of the Holy Spirit. A few things that we can see about the personality, or excuse me, personality or divine attributes of the Spirit that come straight from the scriptures um, are as follows. We see that from Romans 8, he has a mind. In 1 Corinthians 12, he has a will. In Romans 15 and Galatians 5, he has emotions such as love and joy. In Acts 9, he comforts. In Hebrews 3, he speaks. In 1 Corinthians 2, he teaches. In Ephesians 4, he can feel sorrow. And in Hebrews 10, he can be insulted. In Acts 7, he can be resisted. And in Acts 5, he can be lied to. And Graham Cook, who's a favorite teacher of mine, he also loves to talk about how much joy that he, the Holy Spirit has, and about how he even has a sense of humor, which isn't that great, because really when you think about it, the best parts of our humanity are really a reflection of God's divine image in us. And so we see those things as we begin to um, get to know the Holy Spirit and who he is. So... If the Holy Spirit is a personal being, then we know that we can have a relationship with him. I love how John 14, 16 in the message, um, Jesus says, you know, I'm going to talk to the Father and he'll provide you another friend, the Holy Spirit, so that you will always have someone with you. The Holy Spirit is first and foremost our friend. And as the scriptures say, you know, he's the one who searches the deep things of God and reveals them to us. So I really believe that our intimacy with the Trinity rests in knowing the Holy Spirit well. He's the one who searches the mind of God, and then he brings that revelation to us. We can see that in 1 Corinthians 2. So right, what a gift that the Father has sent the Spirit to be with us on earth after Jesus has ascended to take his rightful place beside the Father. And I have to be reminded of this, especially as I'm seeking empowerment of the Spirit for ministry. Because the Holy Spirit, again, it's, it's not some force to be controlled or wielded, like I said, like in the movie Star Wars. 
You know, he is God. The Holy Spirit was God. And the only thing that we can control about the Holy Spirit is how yielded and how obedient we are to him. And uh, I have to personally confess that I can get this messed up sometimes. And I think this is one of the places where the train starts to get off the track in regards, in regards to the Spirit. Spiritual pride can quickly creep in if it is all about power. And we don't recognize that the power comes to us as a grace from the person of the Holy Spirit. It's available to all because the Holy Spirit longs to be intimately connected to each of us. So one of the refreshing things for me about preparing uh, for this talk has been just a reminder that the Holy Spirit is my friend and that I want to know his heart even as I let him search mine. And Pastor Kevin, he closes most Sundays with a, blessings, uh, a blessing out of 2 Corinthians 13. And I, again, I love how it's written in the message. And it says this, May the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The Holy Spirit is a personal being, and he wants to be in intimate friendship with you. All right, uh, moving on, let's look at belief number two. And our second core belief about the Holy Spirit here at Third is that there is great power or a real dynamic partnership when the Word of God is united with the Spirit of God. And I'm talking about uh, the Bible and also the spoken word by the Spirit. So there's a quote by Francis Frangipan, and it says this, The Word of the Lord united with the Holy Spirit is the vehicle of our transformation into the image of Christ. Therefore, as you seek the Lord, pray that you will not merely read the word intellectually, rather ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart through the word. And John Bevere puts it this way, the Bible is our map and the Holy Spirit is our guide, all right? There's this very dynamic partnership between the word and spirit. So one of the best ways to actually get to know the Holy Spirit is is to invite him to begin to speak to you as you spend time in the scriptures. This is a wonderful and a practical way to grow in friendship with God. You know, 2 Timothy 3 tells us, you know, scripture is God breathed. The breath of God is very much synonymous, right, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has inspired the divine writing of the scriptures, so he's the perfect person to illuminate those for us. And when we invite the Spirit into our times of meditation on the Word, we begin, to, we begin to experience what Hebrew 4 talks about, which is that Scripture really becomes alive and active, bringing about this intimate and personal revelation to, to us as we spend time reading it. And so, um, yeah, and I think, too, that a Scripture that's anointed by the Holy Spirit can be one of the most powerful things that we can actually release over a person's life or over people. And so whenever I'm doing prayer ministry, um, when I'm praying for situations or for a specific person, I'm almost always asking the Lord if there is something from the scriptures that he would have for me to pray. Because there's something about this dynamic partnership between God's word um, and the Holy Spirit that releases a, a powerful work um, as we pray for people. And my husband, John, he's amazing at this. You know, he has an incredible love for the Word. Uh, he has so much of it hidden in his heart because he loves to meditate on the Word. And so when I pray with him and when we pray with people, it just overflows out of him. And I've witnessed just time and time again how uh, God's Word, when anointed by the Spirit, has brought healing. Um, it's brought great encouragement, um, incredible wisdom, and comfort as we pray over people. So a beautiful partnership when the Word and the Holy Spirit are invited to work together. Now, one thing I do want to touch on, though, is that um, there is this great danger, though, when we divide Word and Spirit, okay? This is why the, the partnership is so important. And um, again, what we often see is that many churches either want to elevate the Scriptures or they want to elevate the Holy Spirit, 
But I think there are some real issues that we, or excuse me, that can arise if we embrace one without the other one. For instance, you know, when we focus only on the word, the danger is that we get to know God in a very um, propositional way. Okay, we know all about him. We've got a lot of head knowledge, but we've had no personal encounter with him. And then our faith becomes all about following a set of rules and principle, and, and we're just not given over to a passionate pursuit of a living and a loving God, all right? We really need God's spirit to bring us the revelation knowledge of God's love for us, and we need to be inviting the Holy Spirit to do that. Ephesians 3 is one of my absolutely favorite prayers, right? And it says that would God strengthen us with power in our inner beings, right, by his spirit, so that we would know how high and wide and deep and how long God's love for us is. There's this way that there's an incredible um, revelation of God's heart that can only come to us by his spirit, okay? So it's very important that we um, get to have both the word and the spirit. Now, the danger of trying to interact with the Holy Spirit without having a good foundation um, in the Word of God is that in our brokenness, right, in our fallenness, in our humanness, we can think that God is telling us to do things that are just not in line with His Word. Um, for example, one, one that you hear about often is, you know, the man who goes to see his pastor and he's so sure that God is telling him to leave his wife and his family and go be with the woman that he's been having an affair with. And God's blessed that and he's heard that from the Lord. But let me tell you, God is just not going to say that, okay? Because his Holy Spirit will not contradict the word that he has inspired, okay? So the scriptures are really a safeguard for us from making mistakes because this side of heaven you know, we will only prophesy in part. There's a way that our, our humanity um, gets mixed up, even with the best of intentions, our brokenness can still affect us. And so um, we just, we want to be people here who really embrace both the word and the spirit. And that's, it, that's exactly why Third Church actually classifies itself or refers it refers to itself as a word and a spirit church. We don't need to elevate one or the other. We want them to exist in dynamic partnership together because we believe that personal transformation, okay, not just head knowledge, and powerful ministry are the re result of a very dynamic partnership between the word and the spirit. All right. The next belief that we're going to talk about um, is the belief that we can experience the person of the Holy Spirit in multiple ways. So we can experience the Holy Spirit as an indwelling presence, which we often refer to at third as the spirit within. And we can also experience the Holy Spirit coming upon or an empowering presence, which we often refer to as the spirit upon us. At third, we believe that everyone receives God, God's Holy Spirit at salvation. And so the image that I want to work with a little bit here today is an image of fire. So when we accept the work that Christ has done on our behalf, the Holy Spirit is deposited in us, and we are sealed, right? We are sealed by it for our salvation. It says if a candle is lit within us, okay, as the Holy Spirit comes and brings life to our spirits, which were once dead because of sin, okay? Now, in Reformed theology, we believe that once that candle is lit, that it can't be snuffed out, but we do believe there is a very dynamic reality to fire, okay? You know from sitting around a campfire that there is so many things that we can do to either fan the flames, causing it to burn larger and hotter, or there are things that we can do to diminish it to the point that the light and the heat coming from it are so diminished that they have almost no effect on what's happening around it. And I think the image of fire is a good one for the Holy Spirit because when the Lord tells us to be lights for him, right, his disciples would have been thinking about fire, right? 
They didn't go to a light switch in, to turn the lights on in a room, okay? They had to light something, right? Fire was their light. And so when we want to be a light for Jesus, there are ways that we have to fan the flames of the Holy Spirit's presence within us, his fire both within and upon us, okay? And so let's talk a little bit more about some of these experiential realities of the Spirit's work with us. So I want to start off by talking about the spirit within or the indwelling presence. Now, now the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is most often associated with the fruits of the spirit and with our character. That comes right out of Galatians 5. And the fruits are cultivated, right? They take time to grow and to develop. We have to tend to our spirits to grow these fruits in our lives. The Holy Spirit, like I said before, also comes within the people for salvation and sonship. You know, Romans 18 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Okay? So before we accept Christ as our Savior, our spirits are basically dead within us. You know, we're like an unlit candle. Okay? And it's when we accept the finished work of Christ on our behalf that the Holy Spirit is able to come to dwell within us, our spirits, and that's little s, right? They're awakened, they're, a flame is lit, and we now, have the in, or we now have the ability to interact with the Holy Spirit, the big S. So our little s spirits can now interact with the Holy Spirit when we um, accept uh, Christ's work on our behalf, okay? So that's kind of a picture of the indwelling presence of the Spirit's work in our life. Uh, we also see the inward work of the Spirit in us as we grow in wisdom, um, as we grow in faith, okay? And there's a very high level of cooperation of your will to tend to the work of growing the fruits of the Spirit within us. Um, it's a more slow work. And again, this is something we're going to be tending to for the rest of our life. So just a quick picture from my own life, for instance. Um, there was a season where I felt like the Lord was asking me to grow in the fruit of self-control. Okay? So I prayed, Lord, what are some specific ways that you were asking me to work this out in my life? And um, he gave me some very practical tools. He said, I want you to get up earlier to read your Bible and pray. And specifically, he asked me to come to our lighthouse every single morning um, at 6 a.m. for 40 days straight, okay? Um, I was called to a weekly fast. Um, there were some calls to exercise, to Sabbath keeping, to healthy eating. There were some very deliberate choices that I made so that I could cooperate with the work that I believed that the Holy Spirit was wanting to grow in my life. Now, I didn't do these things perfectly, okay, but I do believe that there was some very, very healthy growth um, in the fruit of self-control during this season of my life. So as I obeyed the prompting of the Holy Spirit and then cooperated with the Spirit, good fruit was born in my life. And I think, you know, we should almost always be asking the Lord, Lord, what fruit are you wanting to grow in me right now. What, are you, what fruit are you wanting to work on? Because um, God really longs to grow more of his godly character within our lives, but it really does take a level of both intentionality and cooperation for us in order to help that fruit grow. So that's kind of a picture of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk a little bit more about the Spirit upon. And um, when we talk about the Spirit upon, this is it usually is typically associated with spiritual gifts. Gifts are given, okay? Um, it's Holy Spirit's work for empowerment. Now, the fruits of the Spirit, again, not too controversial in the church. Everybody would agree, yes, I need more love, more kindness, more patience. But again, for most of us who grew up in more mainline denominations, um, uh, the gifts of the Spirit were much more controversial or just not even talked about, okay? Uh, 
The gifts that I'm talking about are, you know, from 1 Corinthians 12, gifts like prophecy, gifts of healing, uh, gifts of tongues and interpretation, gifts of miracles, discernments of spirits, etc. Okay? Now, for the sake of time, I, I can't go through and unpack what each of those gifts are, but do know that here at Third, we believe that all of these gifts are still given by the Holy Spirit to do the work of bringing the kingdom more fully to the earth. So we embrace all of the gifts and the empowering work of the Holy Spirit here. And you see over and over in the scriptures that the presentation of the gospel was often accompanied by a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power, okay? So there is a way that the kingdom of God is forcefully advanced when the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is also expressed alongside the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, okay? These gifts come to us as a grace from the Holy Spirit, but we are encouraged to ask for them, all right? We're encouraged to seek them. And that's really how most things in the kingdom work, right? Uh, we have, God wants us to seek after him, all right? The Lord loves when we seek him. Uh, the spiritual gifts really are mostly about ministry to other people as well. So God gives us those gifts um, to empower us to minister to others. And again, I think for kingdom um, expansion purposes. So uh, one of the other things that we often talk about here is that since the Holy Spirit is the giver of all gifts, he can give us any gift he wants at any point in ministry, all right? Now, there are ways that we're probably going to operate in certain gifts more strongly. Um, so you may have a bent towards prophecy or a bent towards discernment of spirits or um, uh, a bent towards healing. But um, don't ever limit how the Holy Spirit might want to use you in a given situation. And I think that the church has done um, people kind of a disservice uh, we got so pumped about, like, well, what's your spiritual gift? And I can do these three things. And I'm like, come on. If you have the Holy Spirit within you, you can do way more than three things, okay? He can do whatever he wants with you if you are obedient and submitted to him, okay? And so just be open that uh, the Holy Spirit may want to use you um, in a ministry situation in a way that... Um, in any way that he wants, basically, okay? Now, uh, kind of an image that we can use to think about the fruits or the indwelling presence uh, of the Spirit and then the gifts of the Spirit um, would be using an image of two trees, okay? So the gifts of the Spirit can be kind of like ornaments on a Christmas tree, right? You place ornaments on the tree, you know, they're put upon it, they can be taken off, they can be arranged, they come from the outside, from a work of the Spirit upon. Well, as the inward fruits of the Spirit, um, they really are much more like the fruit on a fruit tree, right? They grow gradually, they have to be tended, they don't come from the outside, but they literally are born through the life of the tree itself, okay? And our goal is that we want to welcome both of these things in our lives so that we can experience the fullness of the gospel, okay? The fullness of the Spirit. But I will say this. Fruits are really foundational um, to keeping us safe in our ministry life. Because the gifts are often about ministry to other people, um, it's easy to let them overshadow the fruits. Um, and I love, there's a prayer that John Revere prayers that I think we would all be wise to pray. He just simply says this, Lord, may the gifts that you have placed on my life never supersede the fruit that you have developed in me. We want to have, a, we want to have strong, godly character so that we are able to stand under the giftings that the Holy Spirit wants to give us. All right. Finally, how do we receive or uh, the gifts or experience the empowering work of the Holy Spirit? All right, well now let's take a moment and talk a little bit about how do we receive the gifts or the empowering work of the Holy Spirit? And in my opinion, this is where a lot of the divisiveness um, in the church has happened. So, do we have to have a baptism of the 
the spirit experiences. They're a second blessing in order to operate in these gifts. And, and if that's the case, what should that look like? Will we know that it happened? Will we speak in tongues? Will we fall to the floor? Will we um, feel waves of love? You know, what is this empowering presence of the Holy Spirit look like in our life? And here's where I'm going to land on this. This is one of those places where I think we have to embrace a little bit of mystery. We can see things that often happen uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, but we never want to say always, all right? Because our God is just so not formulaic, okay? Once again, he is all about relationship, all right? So, um, so we just have to be open to how the Holy Spirit may want to come um, in his way, all right? So here's the deal. We all have the Holy Spirit within us, um, what are the things that often seem to fan the flame of empowerment by the Spirit? So we know we have the Holy Spirit within us, but how do we fan these flames for empowerment? So I'm going to again use this phrase. Here are things that we often, but not always, see when it comes to fanning the flame for empowerment, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. So first off is this. There's often something to asking for the Spirit's empowerment in your life, okay? And oftentimes, our uh, journey towards empowerment by the Spirit is preceded by great struggle or pain or hardship, okay? And I think that happens because that actually creates in us a deep hunger for more of God. Uh, for me, this awakening to a longing for greater intimacy with the Spirit really happened as my mom battled a very aggressive form of cancer that she later died from. I was desperate for more of God, okay? And the Holy Spirit met me in that place, okay? Um, you know, what's Luke 11 say? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So I think according to these verses, the Lord is delighted to answer this prayer, to release more of the Holy Spirit's empowering work in our lives. Uh, secondly, there seems to be a way that um, empowerment can often happen when someone who already operates um, in the empowering work of the Spirit, lays hands on and prays for this empowering work over other people. Okay, you see that all over in Acts, that there's a, a laying on of hands, a releasing of giftings um, before people are sent out in ministry. And experientially, I still see this all the time today, that there's a way that um, God, uh, the Holy Spirit still chooses to impart or to release things from person to person. And so, um, oftentimes, there'll be a release of gifts with the laying on of hands. Uh, the other thing I would comment on is that I've also seen repentance play a really huge role um, in this dynamic reality for empowerment. Um, and I think that's because um, repentance kind of clears out the way, right? It clears out the junk kind of from um, our spirits so that we're so that we're actually able, in some ways, to um, have a greater capacity to hold what the Spirit wants to do within um, and upon us, okay? Now, um, in the 15 years, though, that I've been journeying with more of the empowerment aspects of the Spirit, I, I do, though, I have to confess that I've seen Him work in so many ways, okay, and in so many people that I, I just don't have a real strong desire to definitively say that this is how He's going to come and this is what will happen, okay? So I'm just going to close this section by saying we don't believe that there's kind of a one and done reality to the Holy Spirit, but instead we're called to tend the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit in our life, and create space through a, a yielded and obedient life for the gifts of the Spirit to flow, okay? All right. Um... Now, I want to take a few minutes and just briefly talk about the role of the Holy Spirit as we pray for other people, okay? Um, again, the gifts and the fruits, not one or the other, are really very powerful for us as we minister to people in prayer. And honestly, one without the other, I think, can fall short of what the Lord longs to bring to somebody. 
Um, for instance, you know, I could be like the most prophetic person in the world. You know, you could come to see me with great pain in your life and, and maybe I can totally read your mail, right? I could tell you exactly what was going on in your life. Um, you know, things about your childhood or your family, things that I shouldn't be able to know, but I perceived through the prophetic. And if I tell you all of these things, but I express no love, I express no compassion or no kindness as I minister to you, you know, you're going to probably experience me, um, as Paul said, as, as a clinging symbol, all right? Now, in the reverse, I may be full of kindness and mercy and love, you know, but if you're really battling a particular stronghold in your life, maybe even sickness or a disease, we want to be able to not only minister out of compassion, but we want to be able to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can see people set free, so that we can see people delivered, and so that we can see diseases healed, all right? But again, here's the good news. We don't have to choose between either the fruits or the gifts because it blesses God's heart in those who we are praying for to minister out of both. And when we pray for others, we may experience kind of a manif manifestations of both the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit um, in us, all right? Uh, there are times when your body will have a physical sign of the Spirit upon you. Some of the things we experience most here at 3rd are um, heat flowing through our hands or almost like an electricity. Uh, there can be trembling, shaking. There might be a very weighty or a, a heavy feeling. Um, you might receive prophetic insight or words of knowledge as you pray. These would be some signs that the Holy Spirit has come upon you um, to release his gifts over you as you pray for people, all right? Now, you may also just experience God's heart for that person. You might be overwhelmed by his love. Um, the Holy Spirit might allow you to feel a very deep grief. You, he may uh, allow you to feel an incredible kindness or mercy. And those are reminiscent, right, of his fruit just welling up inside of you um, as you're in ministry to that other person. So there's just a lot of beauty, I think, when we can hold these two realities together as we pray for people. And so, um, yeah, so I hope some of what I've shared today um, is going to be a helpful uh, guide for you as you think about the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And as I said when I started, I hope that most of all that this would stir up in you just the desire to be in a more intimate and um, personal relation uh, with the Holy Spirit in